Ulysses by James Joyce, Section 9. A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire. Michael Hind. Amanda Blagg. Colin Robertson. Wilson Blakeman. Christine Myers. Andrew Skinner. Mike Trevino. Jean-François Rondeau. Urbane, to comfort them, the Quaker librarian purred. And we have, have we not, those priceless pages of Wilhelm Meister, a great poet on a great brother poet, a hesitating soul taking arms against a sea of troubles torn by conflicting doubts as one sees in real life. He came a step, a sink pace forward, on a neat's leather creaking and a step backwards, a sink pace on the solemn floor, a noiseless attendant, setting open the door but slightly, made him a noiseless beck. Directly, said he, creaking to go, albeit lingering, the beautiful, ineffectual dreamer who comes to grief against hard facts, one always feels that Goethe's judgments are so true, true in the larger analysis. Twice creakingly analysis he corantoed off. Bald, most zealous by the door, he gave his large ear all to the attendant's words, heard them, and was gone. Two left. Monsieur de la Palisse, Stephen sneered, was alive fifteen minutes before his death. Have you found those six brave medicals? John Eglinton asked with elder's gall. To write Paradise Lost at your dictation? The sorrows of Satan, he calls it. Smile. Smile, Cranley's smile. First he tickled her, then he patted her, then he passed the female catheter, for he was a medical, jolly old Maudie. I feel you would need one more for Hamlet. Seven is dear to the mystic mind. The shining seven, W.B. calls them. Glitter-eyed, his rufous skull close to his green cap desk lamp sought the face, bearded amid dark greener shadow, and Olé, holy-eyed, he laughed low, a Caesar's laugh of Trinity, unanswered. Orchestral Satan weeping many a road, tears such as angels weep, ed elgi avia del cul fato trombetta. He holds my follies hostage. Cranley's eleven true wicklow women to free their sireland. Gap-toothed Kathleen, her four beautiful green fields, the stranger in her house, and one more to hail him. Ave Rabbi. The Tinahi twelve. In the shadow of the glen he cooies for them. My soul, youth, I gave him night by night. God speed, God hunting. Mulligan has my telegram folly persist our young irish bards john eglinton is censured have yet to create a figure which the world will set beside saxon shakespeare's hamlet though i admire him as old ben did on this side idolatry all these questions are purely academic russell oracled out of the shadow I mean whether Hamlet is Shakespeare, or James I, or Essex, clergyman's discussions in the historicity of Jesus. Art has to r reveal to us ideas, formless spiritual essences. The supreme question about a work of art is out of how deep a life does it spring. The painting of Gustave Moreau is a painting of ideas. The deepest poetry of Shelley, the words of Hamlet, bring our mind into contact with the eternal wisdom. Plato's world of ideas. All the rest is the speculation of schoolboys for schoolboys. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer, while tarnation strike me. The schoolmen were schoolboys first, Stephen said superpolitely. 
Aristotle was once Plato's schoolboy. And has remained so, one should hope, John Eglinton sedately said. One can see him, a model schoolboy, with his diploma under his arm. He laughed again at the now smiling bearded face, formless, spiritual, father, word, and holy breath. All father, the heavenly man, Hesios Christos, magician of the beautiful, the logos who suffers in us at every moment. This verily is that. I am fire upon the altar. I am the sacrificial butter. Dunlop, judge, the noblest Roman of them all. A.E., Arvel, the name in ineffable. In heaven height, K.H., their master, whose identity is no secret to adepts. Brothers of the great white lodge, always watching to see if they can help. The Christ with the bride sister, moisture of light, born of an ensouled virgin, repentant Sophia, departed to the plate of Buddhi. The life esoteric is not for ordinary person. O.P. must work off bad karma first, Mrs. Cooper Oakley once glimpsed. Our very illustrious sister, H.P.B.'s elemental. O oh, fie, out, unt, pufightful, you notent look, Mrs. So you notent when a lady's showing off her in elemental. Mr. Best entered, tall, young, mild, light. He bore in his hand with grace a notebook, new, large, clean, bright. That model schoolboy, Stephen said, would find Hamlet's musings about the afterlife of his princely soul, the improbable, insignificant, and undramatic monologue as shallow as Plato's. John Eglinton, frowning, said, waxing wroth, Upon my word, it makes my blood boil to hear anybody compare Aristotle with Plato. Which of the two, Stephen asked, would have banished me from his commonwealth? Unsheath your dagger definitions. Horseness is the wetness of all horse. Streams of tendency and eons they worship. God, noise in the street, very peripatetic. Space, what you damn well have to see. Through spaces smaller than red globules of man's blood, they creepy crawl after Blake's buttocks into eternity, of which this vegetable world is but a shadow. Hold to the now, the here, through which all future plunges to the past. Mr. Best came forward, amiable, towards his colleague. Haynes is gone, he said. Is he? I was showing him Jubainville's book. He's quite enthusiastic, don't you know, about Hyde's love songs of Connaught. I couldn't bring him to hear the discussion. He's gone to Gill's to buy it. Bound thee forth, my booklet, quick, to greet the callous public, writ, I ween, t'was not my wish, in lean, unlovely English. The peat, smoke's, the peat smoke's going to his head, John Eglinton opined. We feel in England, pertinent thief, gone. I smoked his backy, green twinkling stone, an emerald set in the ring of the sea. People do not know how dangerous love songs can be, the auric egg of Russell warned occultly. The movements which work revolutions in the world are born out of the dreams and visions in the peasant's heart of the hillside. For them, the earth is not an exploitable ground, but the living mother. The rarefied egg of the academy and the arena produced the six-shilling novel, the music hall song. France produces the finest flower of corruption in Mallarmé, but the desirable life is revealed only to the poor of heart, the life of Homer's Phaeacians. From these words, Mr. Best turned an offending face to, unoffending face to Stephen. Mallarmé, don't you know, he said, has written these wonderful prose poems Stephen McKenna used to read to me in Paris. The one about Hamlet, he says, Il se promène, lisant, au livre de lui-même. Don't you know, reading the book of himself. 
It describes Hamlet given in a French town, don't you know, a, a provincial town. They advertised it. His free hand graciously wrote tiny signs in the air. Hamlet ou le distrait, pièce de Shakespeare. He repeated it to John Eglinton's new gathered frown. Pièce de Shakespeare. Don't you know, it's, it's so French, the, the French point of view. Hamlet ou the absent-minded beggar, Stephen ended. John Eglinton laughed. Yes, I suppose it would be, he said. Excellent people, no doubt, but distressingly short-sighted in some manners. Matters. Sumptuous and stagnant exaggeration of murder. A deathsman of the soul, Robert Green called him, Stephen said. Not for nothing was he a butcher's son, wielding the sledded pole-axe and splitting in his, spitting in his palm. Nine lives are taken off for his father's one, our father who art in purgatory. Khaki hamlets don't hesitate to shoot. The blood bolted shambles in Act Five is a forecast of the concentration camp sung by Mr. Swinburne. Cannily, I, his mute orderly, follow battles from afar. Whelps and dams of murderous foes whom none but he had spared. Between the Saxon smile and Yankee whelp, the devil in the deep sea. We will have it that Shakespeare is a ghost story, John Eglinton said for the Mr. Best's behoof. Like the fat boy in Pickwick, he wants to make our flesh creep. List, list, oh list. My flesh hears him creeping, hears, if thou didst ever. What is a ghost, Stephen said with tingling energy? One who has faded into impalpability through death, through absence, through change of manners. Elizabethan London lay as far from Stratford as corrupt Paris lies from virgin Dublin. Who is the ghost from limbo partum, patrum? Return to the world that has forgotten him. Who is King Hamlet? John Eglinton shifted his spare body, leaning back to judge. Lifted. It is this hour of the day in mid-June, Stephen said, begging with a swift glance their hearing. The flag is up on the playhouse by the bankside. The bear, Sackerson, growls in the pit near it, Paris Garden. Canvas climbers who sailed with Drake chew their sausages among the groundlings. Local colour. Work in all you know. Make them accomplices. Shakespeare has left the Huguenot's house in Silver Street and walks by the Swan Mews along the river bank, but he does not stay to feed the pen, chivying her game with signets toward the rushes. The Swan of Avalon has other thoughts. Composition of place. Ignatius Loyola, make haste to help me. The play begins. A player comes on under the shadow, made up of the cast-off mail of a court buck, a well-set man with a bass voice. It is the ghost, the king, a king and no king, the, and the player is Shakespeare, who has studied Hamlet all the years of his life, which were not vanity in order to play the part of the spectre. He speaks the word to Burbage, the young player who stands before him, beyond the rack of Sarah calling him by name. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, but bidding him to list. To a son he speaks, the son of the soul, the prince, young Hamlet, and to the son of his body, Hamnet Shakespeare, who has died in Stratford, that his namesake may live on forever. Is it possible that the player Shakespeare, a ghost by absence, and in the vesture of buried Denmark, a ghost by death, speaking his own words to his own son's name, had Hamnet Shakespeare lived, he would have been the Prince Hamlet's twin? Is it possible, I want to know, or probable, that he did not draw or foresee the logical conclusion of those pre premises. You are the disposed son, dispossessed son. I am the murdered father. Your mother is the guilty queen. And Shakespeare, born Hathaway? But this prying into the family life of a great man, Russell began impatiently. Art thou there, True Penny? Interesting only to the Paris clerk, I mean... We have the plays. I mean, we, we read the poetry of King Lear. What is, this, what is it to know how the poet lived? As for living, our servants can do that for us, Villiers de Lille has said. Peeping and prying into the green room gossip of the day, the poet's thinking, the poet's debts, we have King Lear, and it is immortal. Mr. Best's face appealed to, agreed.
now, Sirrah, that pound he lent you when you were hungry? Mary, I wanted it. Take thou this noble. Go to. You spent most of it in Georgina Johnson's bed, clergyman's daughter, agonbite of inwit. Do you intend to pay it back? Oh, yes. When? Now? Well, no. When then? I paid my way. I paid my way. Steady on. He's from Ben Bayant Boyne Water, the northeast corner. You owe it. Wait. Five months. Molecules all change. I'm other. I now. Other. I got pound. Buzz. Buzz. But I, entelechy, form of forms, am I by memory because under ever-changing forms, I that sinned and prayed and fasted, a child con me saved from pandies, I and I, I, A-E-I-O-U. Do you mean to fly in the face of the tradition of three centuries? John Eglinton's carping voice asked. Her ghost, at least, has been laid forever. She died, for literature at least, before she was born. She died, Stephen retorted, 67 years after she was born. She saw him into and out of the world. She took his first embraces. She bore his children, and she laid pennies on his eyes to keep his eyelids closed when he lay on his deathbed mother's deathbed, candle, the sheeted mirror. Who brought me into this world lies there, bronze-lidded, under few cheap flowers. Liliata rutilantium. I wept alone. John Eglinton looked in the tangled glowworm of his lamp. The world believes that Shakespeare made a mistake, he said and got out of it as quickly and as best he could. Bosh, Stephen said rudely. A man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. Portals of discovery open to let in the Quaker librarian, soft, creek-footed, bald, eared, and assiduous. A shrew, John Eglinton said shrewdly is not a useful portal of discovery, one should imagine. What useful discovery did Socrates learn from Xanthippe? Dialectic, Stephen answered, and from his mother how to bring thoughts into the world. What he learnt from his other wife, Myrto, absit nomen, Socratidonians, Epipsychidian, no man, not a woman, will ever know. But neither the midwife's lore nor the caudal lectures saved him from the archons of Sinn Féin and their noggin of hemlock. But Anne Hathaway? Mr. Best's voice said forgetfully, Yes, we seem to be forgetting here, as Shakespeare himself forgot her. His look went from brooder's beard to carper's skull to remind to chide them not unkindly then to the bald pink lollard costard guiltless though maligned he had a good groat's worth of wit stephen said and no truant memory he carried a memory in his wallet as he trudged to romeville whistling the girl i left behind me if the earthquake did not time it, we should know where to place poor Watt, sitting in his form, the cry of hounds, the studded bridle, and her blue windows. That memory, Venus and Adonis, lay in the bedchamber of every light of love in London. Is Catherine the shrew ill-favored? Hortensio calls her young and beautiful. Do you think the writer of Anth Antony and Cleopatra, a passionate pilgrim, had his eyes in the back of his head that he chose the ugliest doxy in all Warwickshire to lie with all? Good. He left her and gained the world of men. But his boy women are the women of a boy. Their life, 
thought, speech, are lent them by males. He chose badly, he was chosen, it seems to me. If others have their will, Anne hath a way, by cock she was to blame. She put the comether on him, sweet and twenty-six, the grey-eyed goddess who bends over the boy Adonis, stooping to conquer as prologue to the swelling act, is a bold-faced Stratford wench who tumbles in a cornfield, a young, a lover younger than herself. And my turn? When? Come. Ryefield, Mr. Best said brightly, gladly, raising his new book, gladly, brightly. He murmured then with blonde delight for all. Between the acres of the rye, these pretty country folk would lie. Paris, the well-pleased pleaser. A tall figure in bearded homespun rose from shadow and unveiled its cooperative watch. I'm afraid I am due at the homestead. Wither away, exploitable ground. Are you coming? John Eglinton's active eyebrows asked. Shall we see you at Moore's tonight? Piper is coming. Piper! Mr. Best piped. Is Piper back? Peter Piper pecked a peck of pick of peck of pickled pepper. I don't, I don't know if I can. Thursday, we have our meeting. If I can get away in time. Yogi Bogey Box in Dawson Chambers. Isis unveiled. Their pally book we tried to pawn. Cross-legged under an umbral, umber shoot. He thrones an Aztec logos functioning on astral levels. Their oversoul, Mahamat, Mahamat, Ma. The famous hermitists await the light ripe for Chelship ring round about him. Lewis H. Victory, T. Caulfield Irwin, Lotus ladies tend them eath eyes, their pineal glands aglow, filled with his god he thrones bud under plantain, golfer of souls, engulfer, he souls, she souls, shoals of souls, engulfed with wailing creek cries whirled whirling they bewail in quintessential triviality for years in this flesh case a she soul dwelt they say we are to have a literary surprise the quaker librarian said friendly and earnest mr russell rumor has it is gathering together a sheaf of our younger poets verses we are all looking forward anxiously Anxiously, he glanced in the cone of lamplight where three faces lighted shone. See this. Remember. Stephen looked down at a wide, headless cobean hung on his ash plan handle over his knee. My cask and sword, touched lightly with two index fingers, Aristotle's experiment, one or two, Necessity is that in virtue of which it is impossible that one can be otherwise. Argal, one hat, is one hat. Listen, young Colum and Starkey, George Roberts is doing the commercial part. Longworth will give it a good puff in the express. Oh, Billy, I like Colum's drover. Yes, I think he has that queer thing, genius. Do you think he has genius, really? Yeats admired his line, as in wild earth a Grecian vase. Did he? I hope you'll be able to come tonight. Malachi Mulligan is coming too. Moore asked him to bring Haynes. Did you hear Miss Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell's joke about Moore and Martin? That Moore is Martin's wild oats? Awfully clever, isn't, he? isn't it? They remind one of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza's. Panza, our national epic has yet to be written, Dr. Surgeson says. Moore is the man for it, a knight of the rueful countenance here in Dublin. With a saffron kilt? O'Neill Russell? Oh yes, he must speak the grand old tongue. 
and his Dulcinea. James Stevens is doing some clever sketches. We are becoming important, it seems. Cordelia, Cordoglia, Cordoglio, Lear's loneliest daughter. Nooks Houghton, now your best French polish. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell, Stephen said, rising. If you will be so kind as to give the letter to Mr. Norman. Oh, yes, if he considers it important, it will go in. We have so much correspondence. I understand, Stephen said. Thanks. Good it'll you. The pig's paper. <laughs> Bollock befriending. Singe has promised me an article for Dana, too. Are we going to be read? I feel we are. The Gaelic tongue wants something in Irish. I hope you will come around tonight. Bring Starkly. Stephen sat down. The Quaker librarian came from the leave-takers. Blushing, his mask said, Mr. Daedalus, your views are most illuminating. He creaked to and fro, tiptoeing up nearer heaven by the altitude of a chopine, and covered by the noise of outgoing, said low, Is it your view, then, that she was not faithful to the poet? Alarmed face asks me, Why did he come? Courtesy or an inward light? When there is a reconciliation, Stephen said, there must have been first a sundering. Yes. Christ Fox in leather trues, hiding, a runaway in blighted tree forks from hue and cry, knowing no vixen, walking lonely in the chaise. Women, he won to him, tender people, a whore of Babylon, ladies of justices, bully tapsters, wives. Fox and geese, and in new place a slack, dishonored body that once was comely, once as sweet, as fresh as cinnamon, now her leaves falling, all bare, frighted of the narrow grave and unforgiven. Yes, so you think. The door closed behind the outgoer. Rest suddenly possessed the discreet vaulted cell, rest or warm and brooding air. A vestal's lamp. Here he ponders things that were not. What Caesar would have lived to do had he believed the soothsayer? What might have been? Possibilities of the possible as possible. Things not known. What name Achilles bore when he lived among women? Coffin thoughts around me in mummy cases, embalmed in spice or words. Thoth, god of libraries, a bird god, moony crowned. And I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest in painted chambers loaded with tile books. They are still. Once quick in the brains of men. Still but an itch of death is in them To tell me in my ear a maudlin tale, Urge me to wreck their will. Certainly, John Engleton mused, Of all great men, he is the most enigmatic. We know nothing but that he lived and suffered. Not even so much. Others abide our question. A shadow hangs over all the rest. But Hamlet is so personal, isn't it, Mr. Best pleaded. I mean, a kind of private paper, don't you know, of his private life. I mean, I don't care a button, don't you know, who was killed or who was guilty. He rested an innocent book on the edge of the desk, smiling his defiance, his private papers in the original. Ta and Baal, Arantir. Time Inno Shaggart, put Burla on it, little John, 
quoth little John Engleton. I was prepared for paradoxes from what Malachi Mulligan told us, but I may as well warn you that if you want to shake my belief that Shakespeare is Hamlet, you have a stern task before you. Bear with me. Stephen withstood the bane of miscreant eyes, glinting stern under wrinkled brows. A basilisk, and quando vedi l'uomo latica, Messer Brunetto, I thank thee for thy word. As we, our mother Dana, weave and unweave our bodies, Stephen said, from day to day, their molecules shuttled to and fro, so does the artist weave and unweave his image. And as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, through all my body has woven of new stuff, time after time, so though the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth. In the intense instant of imagination, when the mind, Shelley says, is a fading coal that which I was, is that which I am, and that which, it, which in possibility I may come to be. So in the future, the sister of the past, I may see myself as I sit here now, but by reflect from, reflection from that which then I shall be. Drummond of Hawthornden helped you at that style. Yes, Mr. Bess said youngly. I feel Hamlet, qu Hamlet quite young. The bitterness might be from the father, but the passages with Ophelia are surely from the son. Has the wrong sow by the lug? Is he in my father? I am his son. That mole is the last to go, Stephen said, laughing. John Angleton made a, a nothing pleasing mow. If that were the birthmark of genius, he said, genius would be a drug in the market. The plays of Shakespeare's later years, which Renan admired so much breath and other spirit. The spirit of reconciliation, the Quaker librarian breathed. There can be no re re reconciliation, Stephen said if there has not been a sundering, said that. If you want to know what are the events which cast their shadow over the hell of time of King Lear, Othello, Hamlet, Troilus, and Cressida, look to see when and how the shadow lifts. What softens the heart of a man, shipwrecked in storms dire, tried, like another Ulysses, Pericles, Prince of Tyre, head, recondicapped, buffeted, Pride blighted, a child, a girl placed in his arms, Marina, the leaning of sophists towards the bypass, or apoph apocrypha, is a constant quantity, John Angleton de detected. The high roads are dreary, but they lead to the town. Good bacon gone musty, Shakespeare bacon's wild oats, cipher jugglers going the high roads, seekers on the great quest. What town, good masters, mummed in names, A, E, Eon, McGee, John Eglinton, east of the sun, west of the moon, Tyr na nog, booted the twain and staved. How many miles to Dublin? Three score and ten, sir. Will we, will we be there by candlelight? Mr. Brandes accepts it, Stephen says, as the first play of the closing period. Does he? What does Mr. Sidney Lee, or Mr. Simon Lazarus, as some aver his name is, say of it? Marina, Stephen says, a child of storm. Miranda, a wonder. Perdita, that which was lost. What was lost is given back to him, his daughter's child. My dearest wife, Pericles says, was like this maid. Will any man love the daughter if he has not loved the mother? The art of being a grandfather, Mr. Best can murmur. L'art d'être grand. His own image to a man with that queer thing genius is the standard of all experience, material and moral. Such an appeal will touch him. The images of other males of his blood will repel him. 
he will see in them grotesque attempts of nature to foretell or repeat himself. The benign forehead of the Quaker librarian enkindled rosily with hope. I hope Mr. Dedalus will work out his theory for the enlightenment of the public. And we ought to mention another Irish commentator, Mr. George Bernard Shaw. Nor should we forget Mr. Frank Harris. His articles on Shakespeare in the Saturday Review were surely brilliant. Oddly enough, he too draws for us an unhappy re relation with the dark lady of the sonnets. The favoured rival is William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. I own that if the poet must be rejected, such a rejection would seem more in harmony with, what shall I say, our notions of what ought not to have been. Felicitously he ceased, and held a meek head among them, ox egg, prize of their fray. He vows and these her with grave husband words, Dost love, Miriam? Dost love thy man? That may be too, Stephen said. There is a saying of Goethe's which Mr. McGee likes to quote. Beware of what you wish for in youth, because you will get it in middle life. Why does he send to one who is a buona roba, a bay where all men ride, a maid of honour with a scandalous girlhood, a lordling to woo for him? He was himself a lord of language and had made himself a cloistral gentleman and had written Romeo and Juliet. Why? Belief in himself has been untimely killed. He was overborne in a cornfield first, ryefield, I should say, and he will never be a victor in his own eyes after nor play victoriously in the game of laugh and lie down. Assumed Don Giovannism will not save him. No later undoing will undo the first undoing. The tusk of the boar has wounded him there where love lies a bleeding. If the shrew is worsted, yet there remains to her woman's invisible weapon. There is, I feel in the words, some goad of the flesh driving him into a new passion, a darker shadow of the first, darkening even his own understanding of himself. A like fate awaits him and the two rages commingle in a whirlpool. They list, and in the porches of their ears I pour. The soul has been before stricken mortally, a poison poured in the porch of a sleeping ear. But those who are done to death in sleep cannot know the manner of their quell unless their creator endow their souls with that knowledge in the life to come. The poisoning and the beast with two backs that urged it King Hamlet's ghosts could not know of where of were he not endowed with knowledge by his creator. That is why the speech, his lean, unlovely English, is always turned elsewhere, backward. Ravisher and ravished, what he would but would not, go with him from Lucrece's blue-circled ivory globes to Imogen's breast, bare with its mole sink-spotted. He goes back, weary of the creation he has piled up to hide him from himself, an old dog licking an old sore. But because loss is his gain, he passes on towards eternity in undiminished personality, untaught by the wisdom he has written or by the laws he has revealed. His beaver is up. He is a ghost, a shadow now, the wind by Elsinore's rocks or what you will, the sea's voice, a voice heard only in the heart of him who is the substance of his shadow, the son consubstantial with the father. Amen, responded from the doorway. Hast thou found me, O oh mine enemy? Entracte. A rivaled face, sullen as a dean's, Buck Mulligan came forwards then, blithe and motley, towards the greeting of their smiles. My telegram. You are speaking of the gaseous vertebrate, if I mistake not, he asked of Stephen. Primrose vested, he greeted gaily with his doffed panama, as with a bauble. They make him welcome. Was du verlacht, wirst du noch deinen. Brood of mockers, Fodius, Sudamalaki, Johann Most. He who himself begot, middler of the Holy Ghost, and himself sent himself, Eigenbeier, between himself and others, who, put upon by his fiends, stripped and whipped, was nailed like bat to barn door, starved on cross tree. Who let him bury, stood up, harrowed hell, fared into heaven, 
and there these 1900 years sitteth on the right hand of his own self, but yet shall come in the latter day to doom the quick and dead, when all the quick shall be dead already. He lifts hands, veils fall, O oh flowers, bells with bells with bells acquiring. Yes, indeed, the Quaker librarian said. A most instructive discussion, Mr. Mulligan, I'll be bound, has his theory too of the play and of Shakespeare. All sides of life should be represented. He smiled on all sides equally. Buck Mulligan thought, puzzled. Shakespeare, he said. I seem to know the name. A flying sunny smile rayed in his loose features. To be sure, he said, remembering brightly, the chap that writes like Singe. Mr. Best turned to him. Haynes missed you, he said. Did you meet him? He'll see you after at the DBC. He's gone to Gill's to buy Hyde's Love Songs of Connacht. I came to the museum, Buck Mulligan said. Was he there? The bard's fellow countrymen, John Eglinton answered, are rather tired, perhaps, of our brilliancies of theorizing. I hear that an actress played Hamlet for the 408th time last night in Dublin. Vining held that the prince was a woman. Has no one made him out to be an Irishman? Judge Barton, I believe, is searching for some clues. He swears, His Highness not his lordship, by St. Patrick. The most brilliant of all is that the story of Wilde's, Mr. Best said, lifting his brilliant notebook, that portrait of Mr. W. H., where he proves that the sonnets were written by William Hughes, a man of all, a man all Hughes. For William Hughes, is it not? The Quaker librarian asked. Or Huey Wills, Mr. William himself, W.H., who am I? I mean, for Willie Hughes, Mr. Best said, amending his gloss easily. Of course it's all paradox, don't you know? Hughes and Hughes and Hughes the color. But it's so typical the way he works it out. It's the very essence of wild, don't you know? The light touch. His glance touched their faces lightly as he smiled. A blonde, if he... Tame essence of wild. You're a darn witty. The three drams of Usbek whiskey by you drank with Dan Easy Ducats. How much did I spend? Oh, a few shillings. For a plump of pressmen. Humor wet and dry. Wit. You would give your five wits for youth's proud livery he, he pranks in. Liniments of gratified desire. There may be mo. Take her for me. In pairing time. Jove, a cool time, send them. Yea, to love her. Eve, naked wheat bellied sin. A snake coils her. Fang in's kiss. Do you think it is only a paradox, the Quaker librarian was asking? The mocker is never taken seriously when he is most serious. They talk seriously of mocker's seriousness. Buck Mulligan's again heavy face eyed Stephen a while. Then his head wagging, he came near, drew a folded telegram from his pocket. His mobile lips read, smiling with new delight. Telegram, he said, wonderful inspiration. Telegram, a papal bowl. He sat in a corner of the unlit desk, reading aloud joyfully, the sentimentalist is he who would enjoy without incurring the immense debtorship for a thing done. Signed, Daedalus. Where do you launch it from? The Kipps? No. College Green. Have you drunk the four quid? The aunt is going to call on your unsubstantial father. Telegram, Malachi Mulligan, the ship lower, Abbey Street. Oh, you peerless mummer. Oh, you priestified kinshite. Joyfully, he thrust the message and envelope into a pocket, but keened in querulous brogue. It's what I'm telling you, Mr. Honey. It's queer and sick we were, Haynes and myself. The time himself brought it in. Twas murmur we did for a gallon potion, for a gallus potion would rouse a friar, I'm thinking, and he limp with leching. And we one hour and two hours and three hours in Connery sitting civil, waiting for pints apiece. He wailed. And we to be there, Mavron, and you to be unbeknownst, sending us through conglomerations the way we have our tongues out of yard like the drouthy clerics to be fainting for a pussful. Stephen laughed. Quickly, warningfully, Buck Mulligan bent down. The tramper Singe is looking for you, he said, to murder you. He heard you pissed on his hall door in glass hole. He's out in Pamputis to murder you. Me! Stephen exclaimed. That was your contribution to literature. Buck Mulligan gleefully bent back, laughing to the dark eavesdropping ceiling. Murder you! He laughed. Harsh gargoyle face and wo that warred against me over our mess of hash, of lights in Rue saint andre des Arts, In words of words, for words, palabras. Oisin with Patrick. Fawn men, he met me in Clarmart Woods, brandishing a wine bottle. C'est vendredi saint. Mothering Irish. 
his image wandering, he met. I mine. I met a fool in the forest. Mr. Lister, an attendant, said from the door ajar, in which everyone can find his own. So Mr. Justice Madden, in his diary of master silence, has found the hunting terms. Yes? What is it? There's a gentleman here, sir, the attendant said, coming forward and offering a card. From the freeman. He wants to see the files of the Kilkenny people for last year. Certainly, 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 is the gentleman. He took the eager card, glanced, not saw, laid down, unglanced, looked, asked, creaked, asked. Is he... Oh, there! Brisk in a gillard he was off and out. In the daylit corridor he, wa he talked with voluble pains of zeal, in duty bound, most fair, most kind, most honest, broad brim. This gentleman? Freeman's journal? Kilkenny people? To be sure. Good day, sir. Kilkenny? We have certainly. A patient silhouette waited, listening. All the leading provincial, Northern Whig, Cork Examiner, and Escort Three, Guardian, 1903. Will you please? Evans, conduct this gentleman. If you just follow the attend, or please allow me, this way, please, sir. Voluble, dutiful, he led the way to all the provincial papers about a bowing dark figure following his hasty heels. The door closed. The sheeny! Buck Mulligan cried. He jumped up and snatched the card. What's his name? Ikimos? Bloom, he rattled on. Jehovah, collector of prepuces, is no more. I found him over in the museum where I went to hail the foam-born Aphrodite. The Greek mouth that has never twisted in prayer. Every day we must do homage to her. Life of life, the lips a-kindle. Suddenly he turned to Stephen. He knows you. He knows your old fellow. Oh, I fear me. He is Greeker than the Greeks. His pig Galilean eyes were upon her misial groove. <laughs> Venus Calipite. <laughs> oh, the thunder of those loins. The god pursuing the maiden hid. We want to hear more, John Eglinton decided, with Mr. Best's approval. We begin to be interested in Mrs. S. Till now, we had thought of her, if at all, as a patient Griselda. A Penelope stay-at-home. Antisitism. <laughs> Pupil of Gorgas. Stephen said, took the palm of beauty from Curios Melanus. Prude dam. <laughs> Aggrieve Helen, the woodman, mayor of Troy, in whom a score of heroes slept and handed it to poor Penelope. Twenty years he lived in London, and during part of that time he drew a salary equal to that of the Lord Chancellor of Ireland. His life was rich, his art more than the art of feudalism, as Walt M Whitman called it, is the art of surfite. Hot herring pies, green mugs of sack, honey sauces, sugar of roses, march pain, goose-buried pigeons, ringo candies, Sir Walter Raleigh. When they arrested him, had half a million francs on his back, including a pair of fancy stays. The gone-bin woman, Eliza Tordur, and underlinen enough to vie with her of Sheba. Twenty years he dallied there, between conjugal love and its chaste delights of scoratory love and its foul pleasures. You know Manningham's story of the burgher's wife who bade Dick Barbage to her bed after she had said, seen him in Richard III and how Shakespeare, overhearing, without more ado about nothing, took the cow by the horns and, when Burbage came knocking at the gate, answered from the capon's blankets. William the Conqueror came before Richard III and the gay lakin, Mistress Fitton, Mountain Cryo and his dainty bird's nest. Lady Penelope Rich, a clean quality woman is suited for a player, and the punks of the bank side a penny a time. Cour la reine, encore vingt sous. Nous ferons de petites cochonneries. Minette, tu veux? The height of fine society, and Sir William Davenant of Oxford's mother, with her cup of canary for every cock canary. Buck Mulligan, his pious eyes upturned, prayed. Blessed Mary, Margaret Mary, any cock and Harry of six wives' daughters and other lady friends from neighbor seats as Lawn Tennyson, gentleman poet, sings. But all those twenty years, what do you do, poor Penelope in Stratford? 
was doing behind the diamond panes. Do and do. Thing done. In a rosary of Fetter Lane of Gerard. Herbalist, he walks. Great Auburn. And Azard, herba like her veins. Lids of Juno's eyes, violet. He walks. One life is all. One body. Do, but do. Afar in a reek of lust and squalor, hands are laid on whiteness. End of section 9A.